The subject of Alternative Views News Magazine for the evening is Boy Prostitution, the widespread use and abuse of male children for sexual purposes. Some of the language in the program may be offensive to some people. Admittedly, the whole subject is offensive. In 1979, there was a call boy ring operated out of New York City, which had phone hookups with Houston, Atlanta, Los Angeles, New Orleans, Washington, D.C. And that callboy ring had a list of 10,000 clients who could call and with a credit card purchase a boy. Hello. Hello. Uh, this is uh, credit card number 06789. Uh, I'd like to make an order, please. Go ahead. I'm looking for a young male, blonde hair, blue eyes. Body hair or no body hair? Thick body hair, please. What age? Uh, 10 to 12. Butch or femme? Butch, please. What is your address? I'm at the Houston Marriott Hotel, room 313. Wire me $200 now by credit card and have $100 in cash for the boy. He'll be there in 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. In Houston, I, I give the figure based on, I think, prudent calculations that upwards of 350 boys a year are killed deliberately because of this. Many more die of drug overuse, mal malnutrition, of suicide. The national toll per year is in the thousands every year. Kids die violently because of this. It's closely attached to the major financial, commercial, industrial, educational institutions of our society. It's run by the same people who run those. It's frequented by the same people who occupy management positions in those. It's not the mafia. It's, it's an adjunct of clean business. It's serving the most respectable people we have in our society, the people who uh, are the elite. Prostitution of male children tonight on Alternative Views News Magazine. Tonight's program on alternative views is one which you may quite frankly not want to watch. It's going to be very disturbing. The subject is very controversial, even disgusting. The language in some of them may be offensive to some people. But we're going to find out tonight about the seamier side of the American power structure and maybe something about male homo sapien. Because the subject of tonight's program is boys for sale, boy prostitution. Where these kids come from, how they're used, how they're abused, tortured, killed, used sexually, and who is it that's doing it? We find some very shocking things are happening. We have with us Tom Philpott, the History Department of the University of Texas, is a special guest. And in addition, Mark McKinnon, former editor of the Daily Texan at the university. Tom has been doing a lot of research on the subject, and Mark was involved in some articles, very controversial articles, a couple of years ago. But before we have our program on boy prostitution, here are some news stories. Well, I guess most of you saw the movie The Day After. William F. Buckley, in his magnificent mind, 
calls it sheer humbuggery <clears throat> and it was a result of junk thought. And then he, he includes with this, Buckley, I don't know, he's, he's just getting senile or what. I remember, um, oh, a few months ago, he uh, wrote an article saying that uh, if Nicaragua continues to do what they do, we're going to declare war on them and their backers, Cuba and the Soviet Union. Go to war, World War III over Nicaragua. Well, anyway, he talks about the nuclear war this way. Remember this, folks. A full-scale nuclear war would mean about 100 million Americans dead. Those 100 million are going to die one of these days without nuclear anesthetic, and they'll in almost any case die more painfully. Then what the hell? Let's have World War III. You know, he is really obscene. I think he, his mind got frozen in the 1950s during the McCarthy period where he literally believed that there was a monolithic totalitarian evil in the world, the Soviet Union, and everything they do is bad. Everything we do to counter this is good, including, you know, war and <laughs> militarism and even nuclear um, war would be justified against this evil. It's almost mm -hmm. sort of a very simplistic Christian view of this Manichaean religious sect in the fourth century that saw a battle between Satan and the Lord as the primary forces of history. And that's Buckley's mindset. Well, there are a lot of religious nuts now who are welcoming the nuclear holocaust because that would bring on the second coming of Jesus. So let's, let's don't have any of this nuclear free stuff. Well, they're even trying to say that uh, nuclear war is okay in England. The Ministry of Defense in England uh, has a PR uh, propaganda uh, race going. They're distributing pamphlets, and for a while they were dickering with J. Walter Thompson, the big American advertising firm, for a $1.5 million contract to produce slick commercials praising nuclear bombs and saying, hey, we can't let people bully us around. We need these things. They, uh, the Mother Jones quoted... Uh, Somebody from the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament there, Monsignor Bruce Kent, he was saying if there's any factor that got the people in England upset, it was our own government's civil defense program telling people to protect themselves against nuclear war by staying at home, by hiding under kitchen tables, and whitewashing their windows. A recent poll, by the way, indicates that uh, one half of the British people are opposed to these additional missiles being brought into the British Isles. As are a growing number of the Germans, there's been several articles mm -hmm. about the growing resistance in Germany to the implementation of these uh, missiles. In the, fact, yeah, go ahead. In, in Germany, there was uh, back in uh, September, first thing I've heard about it, that U.S. soldiers had conducted a mass mock burial exercise. Uh, called, uh, well, I'll save the name until later. Anyway, the exercise trained soldiers how to use bulldozers to prepare for mass graves in the case of nuclear war God. in Europe. It's the first time, according to the Army of Stars and Stripes, that this uh, what occurred. This came from Counterspy uh, magazine. And the code name for this exercise, it was Confident Enterprise. Wow, <laughs> I've seen. There's a very interesting article in these times that puts all of the new Cold War in a very good perspective. And that is that the Reagan administration has claimed that it's tremendous spending on defense. It's building up of the nuclear arsenal, the spending on these military weapons, putting these weapon systems in Europe is all necessary because Reagan claims over the last five or six years, the Russians have been increasing their spending on weapons or developments of new weapons, whereas we've been decreasing our spending and have fallen behind the Soviet Union. Well, this article in In These Times indicates that this is total nonsense based on complete myths and lies. First of all, they point out that military spending under the Carter years did not decrease, as Reagan claimed, but increased 2.95 percent from 1977 through 1981. Moreover, the CIA has just come out with a report on Soviet economic trends and policy development that claims that Soviet spending for military weapons, et cetera, has declined over the last year since 1976, and that their, their spending for new weapons and their development of systems has been much lower than the increases in American spending, and the CIA in their report has documented this in great uh, detail. Moreover, Reagan administration has been claiming that one of the priorities of the Andropov 
administration in the Soviet Union is also to develop new weapon systems to increase military spending, etc. Whereas the CIA report also indicate that that is complete nonsense, that there has been a drop of spending for military means under Andropov, who has been dedicating the majority of his new spending programs to non-military civilian expenditures, et cetera. So that it's total nonsense that the Soviets are spending more on money on weapon systems <coughs> and we're spending less. In fact, during the same period, the Reagan administration has increased military spending 16.7% annually, which is the biggest buildup of military defense spending in American history. And in fact, the defense budget that was passed by the Reagan administration for the coming year is the highest that has ever been spent in US history. No less than $249.8 billion will be spent on military spending by the Reagan administration next year, which will include new weapon systems, such as the MX nuclear missile, the B-1 bombers, and other billion dollars programs for all of these new missile um, systems. In fact, the only systems that military systems that the Reagan administration didn't get from Congress was a nerve gas program. Twice the Congress voted it down. Twice the Senate approved it on a tie vote with George Bush uh, casting the tie-breaking vote in both cases. But the Senate House Conference Committee killed the nerve gas program both um, times. But otherwise, Reagan got all the defense spending <clears throat> he it, wanted. It's curious that this CIA report came out because two years ago, from the alternative press, you remember, we carried stories right. with just this such analysis. And the fact that the CIA seems to rediscover this two years later is rather curious. And the fact that they would come out with this right now is even more curious. Reagan just plays fast and loose <laughs> with his statistics and facts. He's literally the biggest liar that we've ever seen in the White House. And there's been some uh, substantial been some good ones. ones in the yeah. last few years. Well, along this same line, the Reagan administration, of course, still clings to the zero option for Europe, meaning that Soviets have to dismantle all of, or most of their existing intermediate range nuclear missiles. And in return, we will not deploy or use the Pershing II or cruise missiles. Well, uh, the counter spy uh, quoted a new Congressional Research Service study, which showed that the bases for the Reagan administration's claims that they needed to do this were all false. Mainly the fact uh, they were saying, the Soviets, of course, say, well, we got to include the British and French missiles in here. And uh, Reagan says, no, we don't need to do this because the French and British forces are insignificant when compared to the Soviet arsenal. But this new congressional study says that isn't true. Britain has four submarines with 16, uh, six warhead missiles each. France has five nuclear submarines with 16 multiple warheads each and 18 land-based missiles and 34 Mirage planes, which can drop a load on the Soviet Union. And they're working up to 1,500 war warheads. And since it only takes a handful to destroy the country, well, uh, that's a plenty. I'm no, it's not uh, too, well, it's understandable. The Soviets would be a bit upset about that. Reagan also says that the British and French forces are independent and uncommitted. The U.S. doesn't have any control over it. But this congressional study says, no, that's not true. The British forces are going right along with and planned in with those of the U.S. And even the French, although they do have their own control of it, they are signatory to some uh, pacts which indicate that they will coordinate their military power with uh, those of the other European countries in the U.S. Reagan also says the British and French arms are strategic and not theater nuclear weapons. Well, when they had the SALT negotiations, the U.S. was saying it was just the opposite. So it depends on what negotiations they're using. They label them the other way. And that's our news segment this evening. Now let's turn to our main focus, boy prostitution. Well, I'm drained already after talking to you people for a couple of days about this subject. I'm absolutely shocked, and I feel degraded, too, as a member of the human race. Tom, can you first give a case history, uh, just a, kind of a typical case history, and then we'll talk in greater detail about what happens. All right, I, I can tell you the biography of a little kid from a hollow in West Virginia 
whose mom and dad went to Houston to find work. They thought that Houston was the capital of opportunity in America. The dad went out there to get a job, a low-level job with an oil company, brought the mother, then set, sent for little Jimmy and his little brother. Jimmy and his brother got to Houston on a Greyhound bus, and his dad and mom failed to pick him up. How old were they? Jimmy at that time was 12 and his little brother was six. They spent the night in the terminal, uh, Jimmy fending off the advances of a number of men. And then the dad came to pick him up the next morning. The parents had both gotten drunk and forgotten to pick up the kids. The boys went to live with their parents. The parents both had severe drinking problems. The dad lost his job. The mother got killed in a car wreck. The little boy was severely injured. Jimmy dropped out of school to try to hustle, was his word, money to help keep the family, what was left of it, together. The dad died uh, choking in his own vomit after a drinking bout. And Jimmy was the sole support of himself and his little brother. The rent was coming round and Jimmy had no money. And then a neighbor kid said to him, you can get $10 just for watching me play with a man. And Jimmy said, that's queer. And his friend said, it's not queer if the guy does it to you. If you just let it happen and all you have to do is watch. Jimmy did it. Then the man offered Jimmy $25 uh, to let the man play with Jimmy. And Jimmy took it, so he had $35. And then he got introduced into the routine. Jimmy was little, uh, only 12, and he was small for his age. And the circuit he went on in Houston was not the main one, which is Montrose. He went to a place nearby, an arcade called Funland. The way that worked was the boys would stand by the machines, and a man would come by. If the man offered quarters, the boy would take them, and then the man and the boy would go off. Jimmy became a professional prostitute at the age of 12. He survived in that capacity until he was 14. Was he working on his own or was he part of an organization? He was not part of an organization. He was what they call the Farm League. And he was taking care of his little brother. His brother got killed in a car wreck when he was driving with some people. And Jimmy then was desolate and almost destitute. Uh, he used the last money he had to bury his brother. He did not want to let his last surviving relative, his grandpa in West Virginia, know the way things had gone. Uh, a reporter in Houston last saw Jimmy across the street from Funland, and a man who used to pay boys for sex then told this reporter, I know that boy. He told a man who's a friend of mine that one time he was having sex with that little boy and then he realized that the boy was crying and he looked up and saw that the boy was sucking his own thumb and at that point he had to break off the encounter. The journalist believes that this reformed man who used to use boys was his own best friend, the boy who had been having sex with Jimmy. Jimmy disappeared. His body was later found mutilated, and his grandfather was notified. The police then told the grandpa in a very cruel way that the grandpa shouldn't try to get a loan from the city of Houston. It would have cost $500 to ship the body to, ship the body to West Virginia because the boy was nothing but a harbor whore or worse. Um, and the grandpa died shortly thereafter. Uh, the whole family is dead now. Jimmy was a typical kid. He wasn't looking for this life. He found it. He needed some means of support. He took what he could get, and he came to grief and met his death. Uh, Houston is possibly the worst city in the United States for the misuse of lost and runaway boys or homeless, defenseless boys. Probably 350 or more boys are killed 
every year in Houston. About Houston? I would say I hear about Houston that it is the worst. Uh, that children are brought to Houston from places such as New Orleans or from other parts of uh, the Southwest. Their life is sad. It's 100% it's sad. They get up, you know, one or two or three during the day and they go out and they have to earn money and they're treated bad. Uh, they eat only when they're fed by somebody else and they never get anything for anything. They always have to return sexual favors for it. They sometimes get beaten, they get robbed, they get pushed. You know, the police abuse them, everybody abuses them. One young man got out of a car, by young man I mean the age of probably 15, maybe 16, and he got out of the car and he was just badly beaten. I mean, there's no two ways about it. He looked right at him and his face was black and blue and blood coming out of his nose and his lip was fat and he couldn't walk very well and he was sick to his stomach in the bushes and he was just very badly beaten. Evidently he had got either a bad trick or the man was on s &M or something and just kind of like shoved him out of the car as he went around the corner opened the door for him and said, get out. Any of them ever want to hurt you? That's why I watch out for them. You watch out for them? Yeah. How do you tell? No, they start to jump now. Want to jump on you? Yeah, if they do, you know, I'll I'll be ready because I'll be watching every time. What do you be doing then? i just be laying down on bed letting them suck and just watch them. But if they start to jump on you, what can you do? I always carry a pocket knife or something like that. I don't know if they hurt me or not. You know, I just watch out for them, just in case they do start. Nine, nine out of ten of them are weird. I mean, they get, you know, there was one guy that picked me up in Atlanta, and he just said, to, you know, he wanted somebody to go out and have a few beers when he would smoke a joint. And we got over there, and I was drinking this beer, and all of a sudden, you know, look, doing like that, you know, I couldn't even see straight. My eyes were rolling back. And then the room started spinning and I was out of it. When I came around, he had me tied up in the basement, no less, way up like this, you know. And I couldn't even move. Did he because, tied up? Yeah, stretched. Tied. What was he doing to you? Nothing, he was just sitting there with this whip looking like he's gonna hit me with it. He just threatened me a lot and I was sitting there crying and scared to death. You know, cause all, the worst they could do is kill me, you know. That interview was conducted several months ago in Houston, Texas. Investigators now fear that the 15-year-old is dead. The body of a young man found ritualistically dismembered in Missouri is thought to be his. I woke up and he had he was clamping handcuffs on me. I was laying on my stomach. The other two were on their stomach and they were handcuffed and their feet were tied. The most shocking and horrifying result of older men having sex with young boys is the story of Dean Coral in Houston, Texas, and more recently John Gacy in Chicago. In Houston, Coral lured or had brought to his home at least 27 young boys, all under the age of 17. The boys were sexually assaulted, then killed. In Houston, I, I give the figure based on, I think, prudent calculations that upwards of 350 boys a year are killed deliberately because of this. Many more die of drug overuse, mal malnutrition, of suicide. The national toll per year is in the thousands every year. Kids die violently because of this. In the first three months of this year, 1981, 30 boys were found dead in Houston. None of them was called a homicide. They were found to be dead of exposure, dead of causes undetermined, dead of massive internal bleeding, as in the case of one child under 10 who was found naked in a Dempsey dumpster with his colon and his rectum torn apart. He was called not a homicide, but a victim of massive internal injury. He was fist raped. Yes. What, what is the sort of psychic roots or the nature of this uh, phenomenon? I've been studying this phenomenon since the spring of 1979, and to the best of my knowledge, most men who seek sex from boys are not homosexuals. To the extent that they have active sex lives uh, at the peer level, they are heterosexual. Many of them have no peer sex at all. There are gay people who are what we call pederists, that is, men who lust after children, especially boys. But it appears to be the case that most such men are not gay, that their 
attraction is for young, defenseless children, especially boys, because they're more exotic and more forbidden. But uh, it is not a matter of uh, gay rights as advocated by practically anybody. This is a, a much different sort of phenomenon. The reason that the gay community usually scorns any investigation of the subject is that they know that the average person in the public will blame homosexuals and homosexuality for the phenomenon, regardless of what facts are presented. Well, this is not just a sexual thing in the way we talk about it. It's a, a power trip, and it's also uh, a sadistic thing because these kids are tortured and killed. The kind of individuals involved are down the line, almost in every instance in the cases I've investigated, men who are very powerful, usually very wealthy, and usually administrate control over a large number of people. Wealthy Houstonians can and do obtain boys in a most discreet manner. It's gotten a little more sophisticated now. It's gotten more, uh, uh, it's gotten more expensive. Prices, higher prices are paid. Uh, and it's, it's gotten a little more sophisticated in terms of, um, oh, I think the types of people who are, who are into it, types of adults who are into it, professional people, uh, Houston uh, professional people? Yeah, yeah. Soliciting boys? Oh, sure. You know, I mean, you can be a millionaire in Houston, man. <laughs> yeah. You have people here that are so wealthy that they can't let anybody know what they're doing that they're willing to pay two, three, four hundred dollars a night, you know, for one of these boys not to say anything about them, you know. You got judges, doctors, lawyers, politicians, uh, advertising people involved in in buying young people for either, if it's for an hour or for a night or for a month or for a year they actually have white slavery in this country it's a fact and in, in houston right now it's going on tom is there any uh, see. evidence that there's any connection with organized crime obviously with other forms of prostitution that we know about there are close connections the mafia has always utilized prostitution as one of the pillars of its organizations and sources of its income. Is there any connection here that has been revealed uh, with organized crime? Yes, when we're talking about 400 kids on the street between two and four in the morning in a city like Houston, there's very little organization. There may be a runner or a pimp who's trying to squeeze the boys a little, but there's no big businessman running a sophisticated operation. But when there is a bookstore with 40 stalls, uh, there's often a stable of boys. That's that's fairly good-sized business, and there's bigger business than that. That's the call boy operations, like this one we described with the 10,000 customers. That's big business. It's crime. It's organized, but it's not the mafia. It's the pillars of our society. Uh, there is big business, mm -hmm. organized crime. It's sophisticated. It's closely attached to the major financial, commercial, industrial, educational institutions of our society. It's run by the same people who run those. It's frequented by the same people who occupy management positions in those. It's not the mafia. It's, it's an adjunct of clean business. It's serving the most respectable people we have in our society, the people who uh, are the elite. I assume you can't name names at this particular time, but... Not if people haven't been apprehended yet. Right, okay. Are senators involved? U U.S. senators? Well, and let, congressmen, let me, do you suppose? Let me give you some information here. Now, this is stuff that has come out of newspaper clippings. It has gotten far enough to get in the newspaper, even if it hasn't been followed up. This was potentially the biggest case of all. At the one in New Orleans? Yes, a New Orleans Boy Scout troop was busted for actually being a callboy ring of boy prostitutes. The man who was the leader of the Boy Scout troop was given 75 years in prison, and then he offered to tell a story. The story he told was that the congressional delegations from two states, one of which was Louisiana and one of which bordered Louisiana, and, as he put it, the entire hierarchy of one of the states, as far as top political posts, 
were all involved as customers of the little boys. And he said he was willing to name all the names. Uh, that was a UPI story of 26 November 1979, and he never talked again. Is he, he in said, jail now? Is he in he's prison? still in jail. He said there was one U.S. senator and many congressmen. Weren't there a couple, uh, actually right wing, uh, new right um, representatives, congressmen in Washington, Bauman. who yeah. were actually um, well found uh, guilty of molesting? <laughs> Doug, I wish you were right. Mm -hmm. uh, Congressman Robert Bauman mm -hmm. was apprehended in February of 1980, mm -hmm. having sex with a 16-year-old boy. For some reason, no charges were brought until September 1980. At that point, the FBI and the U.S. Attorney made an agreement to keep all details of the account out of public records. The charges were dropped on Bauman's promise that he would take a drug or an alcoholic abuse treatment program. He continued in office and he ran for re-election. He was defeated, but he said he would go on to run again. William F. Buckley is one of his closest friends. They were co-founders of Young Americans for Freedom and the American Conservative Union. The way Buckley put it was this, it transpires that during alcoholic bouts he engages in homosexual acts. He went on to say there was a complaint filed by a 16-year-old boy. And then he went on to say Bauman should resign from Congress and resign from the positions in conservative organizations because he was an embarrassment. <laughs> Bauman never went to trial. He didn't actually go to a formal pretrial hearing either. Then there was a Texas Congressman Wyatt who was caught. Uh, well, actually, I, I take it back. He was not caught. A, a juvenile reported that why it had forced sex on him. Charges were never filed. That's a quote. Charges were never filed, despite the fact that the boy had filed a complaint. And Wyatt said he was going to run again uh, when it was published in the Austin paper that uh, the complaint was not that he was drunk driving, but that he had forced sex on a juvenile male. He said he wouldn't run again. He was already in the alcohol rehabilitation program, so there was no trial, no pretrial hearing, no charges. Wasn't there another another uh, yeah. ring of uh, yeah. tour guides, boys as tour guides for congressmen? Well, that you may be referring to the case of Representative Hinson, a Republican from Mississippi, who was found having sex with uh, somebody in the men's room of the Longworth House office building. Uh, there are conflicting accounts. Uh, according to one account, he was having sex with a minor. According to another account, he was having sex with an adult. He uh, said he was innocent, and he agreed to undergo alcohol abuse treatment, and he was not charged. This well, there, there were some the charges were dropped. Well, what was the story about the about the young boys being tour guides for the Capitol, and this was also part of. Uh, a little boy sex ring, and uh, also uh, some of it resulted in campaign contributions. I read that in an article. That has to do with the state of Texas, as a matter of oh, fact. Texas. And uh, here's the way we can tell that story. <laughs> this is one you can't tell. <laughs> well, this is one we can't. It I got into I, the newspaper. Yeah, I saw it in the newspaper. But then it disappeared. Uh -huh. What appeared in the newspaper was a boy's home run by a Texas state representative was being investigated for charge of abuse of the boys. The state representative said that there was no abuse. He claimed that his, his place could not be investigated by the state because it was uh, private, like that of uh, Lester Roloff. Rev Reverend Roloff. The story died and didn't appear in the press anymore. Uh, the lead that uh, produced the initial story was that that representative took co campaign contributions and then the uh, contributors uh, as a reward got to have sex with the boys in the home and that he did this for more than himself but for other representatives that man is out of the state legislature so we've talked about legislators congressmen S a senator senators um, people in the the highest ranks of uh, government at the local, at the uh, state level. Now, are these just aberrations, or is this part of 
a widespread ongoing thing. I think it's very widespread. Uh, and not just among powerful politicians. We've talked about politicians. But it seems to be the case that in all high-powered professions, uh, corporations now we're talking about too. The corporations, uh, medicine, law, even the university, not necessarily professions with uh, bloated salaries, but prestige, some power, influence, and above all, pressure. The men involved are susceptible to this kind of deviation. I'm working right now, you know, like, just, you know, with the corporation. And What's that? How's that work? Well, uh, when their executives or, you know, their business people are in town, uh, they're sent to our apartment, and we entertain them while they're here. Okay, what's that entertainment usually involved? What do they usually demand, or what do they want? Well, it's all kinds of sex and perversions. There's no two alike. I've decided that. Everyone's in for something different, so I can't really stereotype the whole. You know, so all the men want different things? Yeah, right. But we're usually in the passive side, and they're usually the dominant player. What does he do at Grady Hospital? He's a, um, one of them people that um, operates on people. He's a what? Uh, a doctor. Uh, we've talked about those men who have achieved power, and also among those men who wanted it but didn't get it. Mm -hmm. Men like poor Gacy in Chicago who killed at least 33 boys. He was not a well-to-do man, but he was a joiner. He paid high dues to join men's clubs. He paid $1,000 to join the president's club so he could uh, have dinner with Jimmy Carter. And instead, he had dinner with Mrs. Carter and had his picture taken with her. He was uh, an upward striver. He killed at least 33 boys. He offered in his defense that he could not identify any of the 33 boys by face or by name because he had had sex with 1,500 different boys in the previous five years, 300 different kids a year, and most of them, as he said, were prostitutes. He didn't snatch them off the street. He went out and bought their services, and then he coerced them, as this lawyer in Washington says no one ever does. He made them captives, and he killed them. What about women in the positions of power in government? And You don't find women involved in this? Well, you don't I find don't many women involved in positions of power in the uh, American yeah, Maybe that system. explains the, what appears to be the fact. Women don't do this to little girls. Heterosexual women, homosexual women, don't do this to little girls. Or little boys. Or little boys. I mean, it happens, but it's not common, it's not ordinary, it's not a phenomenon. It isn't a threat. Uh, if you have a little girl and you have an adult female friend, you needn't have any apprehension. But if you have little kids who are boys, they are in more danger than the little girls today. Why, why do you think uh, there's so much violence uh, caught up in this? Investigations in other cities have shown that boys, 13, 14, even younger, are coerced into prostitution with threats of physical violence and are sometimes shipped across state lines, shipped to the older adult men who desire young boys for sexual acts. Occasionally, these boys' episodes with their older clients ends in physical violence. There are men who seek young boys to torture and sometimes to kill. This phenomenon is not unique to America. Uh, it may not even be unique to advanced industrial urban societies. In the other places where it occurs, though, it doesn't seem to be attended by a high level of mayhemic violence. In, in the United States, it is. In Islamic countries, for instance, uh, prostitution with boys is a standard. I've been in Morocco and Algeria and observed this, and yet I've never heard any stories of violence being involved. In other words, it's an erotic phenomenon as opposed to this power or psychological um, 
Well, there are those who would have us believe that that is the case in America. Uh, here, for instance, is an article written by a law professor in Washington, D.C., who was general counsel to the Metropolitan Police Department. This article was written in 1981. He says, if the boys are victims, it is largely in the technical sense. It is more accurate to characterize them as entrepreneurs who by and large understand their own motivations. They do it for money, for drugs, for pleasure, and perhaps for some as a crude gambit for emotional sustenance. But unlike teenage girl prostitutes, they do not act out of fear. There is no coerced recruitment, no whippings, no incarcerations in their rooms, and no sweet-talking pimps with Cadillacs. That's not what I have found. So you think that's study. false, that Washington police chief? I think it's false, and I think it's a deliberate falsehood. Mm. Well, let's talk about, we haven't talked about the proliferation in the United States of this. We've talked about a few individual cases. How widespread is it, and what are the numbers we're talking about? Well, we know this, for instance. This is a standard. Uh, a half a million kids run away or are thrown out of homes every year in the United States, and the majority of them are boys. Another thing that the President's Commission on Obscenity found, this is the commission that Richard Nixon repudiated, it mentioned in passing that child pornography was a phenomenon of the abuse of children and then went on to say that for every female prostitute of any age in the United States there are nine boys underage who are prostitutes. That is a finding which is debatable and it is a speculation but it went unnoticed. Uh, I think though that if uh, if you get in a car and prowl the streets of the capitals of this practice Houston, New Orleans, Atlanta, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, and to a much lesser extent, uh, Austin, our state capital, and Washington, the nation's capital, you'll find that boys are the ones hustling more than the women. Mark, uh, some of the research that you did in Austin here that started off your involvement in this issue indicated that there was a possible ring of homosexual boys in Austin. Could you tell some of the uh, facts on this case? Well, my interest in this whole issue originated when, as a reporter for the Daily Texan, we heard through the grapevine that a pharmacist here in town had been busted. And I don't remember the original charge. I'm not sure abuse if it was... Abuse of a boy in a home. I guess it was abuse of a... That's right. Abuse of a boy in a uh, halfway house. Well, the thing that interested us about the case was that the police had later found in his home a file, an index file, of anywhere from two to five hundred names of young boys in the, around the Travis County area and counties uh, accompanying Travis County. And it had their names, phone numbers, parents' names, in many cases, sexual uh, statistics on the, on the uh, personnel, height, age, weight, and in some cases, preferences. And that sounded like an astounding thing to us, that there should be somebody traveling around. And what he did was we, he would hang out at high schools and, and offer the drugs that he had available, as he was a pharmacist, in exchange for sexual favors. Well, we followed that up, and, and uh, somewhere down the line of judicial uh, scrutiny, the entire the evidence was lost or disappeared or was unable to be written attracted and they're, they're, it complicates from there but that's a, that's how we got well Anderson of his name was Anderson Robert Anderson he was found guilty of one charge and sentenced to two years in prison and then he skipped he was he was still not incarcerated he skipped and he's never been found again was there any indication that he was involved with other men who were participating in these favors in other words yes. what would the point of him keeping these uh, cards be, unless there was some sort of business or He was an agent. He was an agent, and he had uh, quantities of drugs. Uh, Mark didn't mention that he listed next to the name of each boy, that boy's personal drug preference. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he also had a, a very large quantity of muscle relaxants to administer to boys mm -hmm. to make sex easier for the men. 
not only that, but there was also the names of several, several well-known business uh, men in the Texas community that, for obvious reasons, were contacts. Okay, what about, you talked about Boy Scout groups and boys' homes. What about these? Well, a boys' home is an ideal place if you want to get in on an operation and get hold of some vulnerable kids. It's an ideal place to do it. In San Antonio this August, two men who were supposed to be Catholic priests uh, were arrested for sodomizing 50 boys, ages three and a half to 14, that year, and they had had uh, several hundred boys in the past three years, they're having sex with the boys on a regular basis. That was why they established the home, to get at little boys. Uh, in Dallas, uh, a place was closed down the year before. In Houston, uh, Jimmy was in a home in Houston for a while, and he was raped by his caretaker. That place was closed down. In Houston, there are only 42 beds available in all the homes for boys in the whole city. And one of the homes that's still open was previously investigated and arrests were made because of attacks on the boys. It's very common. It's very hard to trust any place that presents itself as a home for boys. And one of the tragedies of that is when somebody opens one that is clean, like Covenant House in New York City, operated by Father Bruce Ritter, the first thing that happens is there's a smear campaign against it, and everybody says, it's dirty, too. So if there's a clean one, it gets a bad name. The object is that, that to make it impossible to tell the good ones from the bad ones. I guess the Boy Scout people have this problem, too, don't yes. they? Yes. Uh, we've mentioned a, a couple of Boy Scout rings. That doesn't mean that the Boy Scouts right. are an organized group <laughs> to uh, feed pederists. Uh, yes, what, what about judges and police? Judges and police are in high-pressured professions, involved, too. Uh, in some of these, too, then. To my knowledge, the police are involved less as practitioners of this than the other stressful professions, by far. Um, we mentioned... I should have mentioned the mm -hmm. clergy. With all mm -hmm. regret, the clergy is highly susceptible to this. Real priests, not just bogus priests like those in you San Antonio. You mentioned some of the uh, worst uh, phenomena here, these mass murders in uh, Houston and in Chicago. Does this connect with Atlanta in any way? There's been, as you know, mass murders of all these black children in Atlanta. And as I recall, the FBI, uh, when they initially got in the case, after they made this a federal case, um, Reagan, or I guess it was Bush, went down there, um, the FBI came out with a report that indicated that there may be sex abuse of some sort in the death of these children. Then it seemed to be pretty much dropped after an initial uh, play in the media. Do you have any comments on that? Yes. The first indications that leaked out that maybe the kids who were victimized in Atlanta, murdered, were actually boy prostitutes who went to the people in the cars to make contact, uh, came out in February. And then uh, national or cable news network and ABC News tried to mention this as a possibility. It's a very delicate thing. It's almost an insult and affront to the black community to say the angels of Atlanta were really prostitutes, unless you believe, as I do, and unlike that law professor I quoted, unless you believe they're victims. They're not responsible for what, what is happening. They are being used and abused. But the public reaction was chilly, so the networks dropped it. They revived it in April and dropped it again. I have headlines here, quotations from news broadcasts about the boys possibly being hustlers and that the fellow who has been arrested and indicted being a photographer pr procurer. Uh, among the mothers of the first 10 kids, those women who went public and talked about the, their predicament, uh, is one who said to the wire services in an interview, I'm afraid my son was involved in prostitution. I'm afraid that that's what got him killed. I'm afraid it's the link to the whole 
series of murders, and no newspaper in America printed the wire service copy. Isn't um, part of this whole uh, phenomenon dealt with a business of pornography, child pornography, oh, where pictures yes. are taken of these acts, uh, films are made, and this Wayne Williams, we know is a yeah, photographer, photographer, and we know he has training in electronics. He'd done radio work, he'd done recording work, so might he be involved in a film um, organization, and indeed possibly even a snuff organization. There's been some evidence about uh, snuff films where people are literally killed um, on film and that these are distributed, the films. So is there some possibility that that might be involved? I think in it's possible and I think it's likely. But we're talking about an ongoing case and I think we have to be very careful about what we say. Uh, in Houston, I have seen myself big vans that don't have cabs on them. And I've seen young kids go into the van and not emerge for an hour or an hour and a half. And sometimes with the door open, I've seen photographic equipment inside. A raid was made on a mansion in Houston, although the newspapers in Houston referred to it as a flat. It was a mansion. Inside that mansion was more photographic equipment than KLRN, KLRU possesses. And that's one of the biggest <laughs> stations in the Southwest. Uh, bigger than Channel 13 in Houston possesses. Channel 13 played up the raid, but the news media besides Channel 13 didn't. It was as if uh, five guys in a little studio were taking candid camera shots of kids. They were producing books in there. There was also an arrest in Houston uh, in 1981 of a man who sold 20 different films, child pornography films, to somebody from Boston now, he was committing several fe federal crimes in doing that. Right. And among those films, although the newspapers would not print the information, uh, among those films was that of an infant being sexually used by men and a film in which somebody appears to have been murdered. Uh, that, that person hasn't gone to jail yet. What uh, about the bookstores and the, <clears throat> the places where they show movies and stuff like this? Here, here in town, for instance. I think that how much you don't how find much, much evidence of this sort of thing in the bookstores because it's the people who are trading and, and dealing with this kind of thing, it's a very clandestine operation. And it, having gone through an investigation myself, I know how absolutely impossible it is to trail this stuff. I mean, you're dealing with people who are not stupid. You know, they are in levels of power because they're intelligent people, by and large. Uh, and they, they cover their tracks. And they're not about to be dealing with them through the bookstores. I think maybe five years ago you could find that sort of thing. But now it's, I think it's been pretty much cleaned up. Tom may have more. Well, I went into a, a bookstore in Austin two years ago in daylight. And my experience is the difference between the operation in daytime and nighttime is the difference between night and day. Yet, <laughs> in daylight, I first bought a magazine that had pictures of people of borderline age. They could have been 18, they could have been 17, and 17 is legal. And then I had the names of illegal publications. I first asked for a register that listed uh, boys by description. Uh, it was a, a catalog, you order a boy. I asked for in that. In a bookstore, yeah. here in Austin? Yeah, or, yeah. it's a crime to, to print that, to reproduce it, to distribute it, to buy it possess it. I, I broke the law by saying, I want that. And uh, the guy reached under the counter and handed it to me. Then I said, what about this? And he handed me that. And I said, what about this one? And he handed me one more. And I walked out of there with a lot of illegal goods. Mm -hmm. It was in the daytime. Uh, I understand that as of now, 1981, the same bookstores don't let somebody they don't know do that sort of thing, even at night. <laughs> but I've been in places uh, in Houston within the last several months, one in particular I can describe to you had 40 cubicles uh, where supposedly men go in and put in quarters to watch dirty movies. And outside every cubicle was a little boy. I was approached both by little boys as if I were a man who might want a boy, and I was approached by older men who in the dark thought I looked young. Uh, that was on a weeknight not on Friday or Saturday in Houston. When I started following up 
some films that we heard were circulating in the Houston area, I called an old friend of mine while I was investigating another case involving this because we heard that it had been viewed by the district attorney's office in Houston. This friend was a good friend who I'd known through, from bars, you know, I mean, in a very social atmosphere, not a professional one. And I called him to ask about if he had heard anything about this film or viewed it himself, perhaps. He answered the phone, I said, hello, and we chatted for a moment. I said, by the way, have you heard anything about this film? And he cut me off and said, I've never talked to you before in my life. Boom. And, and I've never talked to him again. And I've known this guy for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. and as soon as I mentioned that film, it's like... Uh, when Boys for Sale was shown on TV, it was shown first as a nightly series, and then there was a summary program. The biggest bank in Houston withdrew its advertising from the show and from the station because it showed that program. Wow. And uh, the bank managed to get the other, the other advertisers for that program to withdraw their advertising. And if I might interject this just for a moment, uh, because it, was, it ties into the power uh, problems. I remember originally with the, the Robert Anderson, the pharmacist we talked about earlier, one of the items found in his apartment was a wallet, or checkbook, I guess, with a student's address and name on it. Well, we started to make some phone calls and try to contact this person. We finally got through to his father, and it turned out it was the one of the major banks in Dallas. His father was the bank president. And we thought we had a hot lead going. And next thing we know, a, a very, I can't mention names here, but a, a very powerful law enforcement agency head called us. We were asking about this individual's name in Dallas. And he called us back and said, and it was so cryptic that it was unusual, he just said, all I can say is forget Dallas. You know, like, don't touch it. Mm -hmm. The Texas House Committee has been charged with looking at the problem. Two public hearings later, the committee has been unable to make any serious progress. Its budget was slashed from $80,000 to $15,000, hardly enough to do an honest probe. And the committee chairman admits to knowing of the problem in Houston, but says he's been told to back off. When we started this committee, we asked for money to do an adequate investigation to determine just how serious the problem of child pornography, child prostitution, sexual exploitation is here in Texas, which I think is, is a, a proper a thing for this committee to do. Now, that was the first indication that we had pressure on us. The second indication was when I appeared before the House Administration Committee, when they chopped our budget and subsequent conversations with certain members that said, we're, we have got to stop our investigation. Why do they want you to stop? I don't know why. I have no... Do you plan I, to find out? I plan to find out. I think it's serious that, they're, that they were getting this kind of pressure. The concluding program of Boys for Sale will emphasize the law enforcement and judicial performances, the handling of the subject by the mass media, and will provide a more intimate understanding of the lives of the children involved. There is big business, mm. organized crime. It's sophisticated. It's closely attached to the major financial, commercial, industrial, educational institutions of our society. It's run by the same people who run those. It's frequented by the same people who occupy management positions in those. It's not the mafia. It's, it's an adjunct of clean business. It's serving the most respectable people we have in our society, the people who uh, are the elite. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78712. We would like very much to hear from you. If you'd like to participate on Alternative Views in some way, or would like to see a previous program repeated, please contact us.